Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're speaking with Daniel Heyman today. Daniel is a painter and a printmaker with many accolades to his name. He's a Pew Fellow and a Guggenheim recipient. His recent project with former prisoners of war at the Iraqi prison Abu Ghraib has become widely seen around the country. For that project, he traveled to Amman, Jordan, and sat in on interviews with former prisoners as they told their stories for a court case filed against the American government. Daniel drew the prisoners' portraits and recorded their stories on copper plates he brought with them, printing the works when he returned home. Right now we're sitting in Daniel's home, where his studio is, and we're sitting beneath a self-portrait that we had previously seen at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. It's a woodblock print, very large. (coughs) Etching, actually. I'm sorry, it's an etching. Thank you for that correction. And he's sitting in a hammock, sleeping. So you were beginning to tell us about your self-portrait projects. Yeah, sure. I was I was asked to participate in PAFA's, uh, I believe it was 2010, artist's self-portrait um, show, several months before the show, and I thought I would do something new because I hadn't done a self-portrait in a long, long time. And I had um, been working with ideas about the Iraqi war for a long time, and I kind of needed a respite went up to um, a place I go to often in the summer, which is up in Truro on Cape Cod. I always have loved the trees up there. They're they're these incredible pine trees. um, They just have a kind of magical feeling about them because they catch the light. The light on Cape Cod is really, really beautiful. The bark is really um, crusty and kind of has a kind of show of age. and, And the trees have a very harsh environment and they don't do very well. So anyway, for many reasons, I was attracted to this environment. And when I go up there in the summer, I always bring a hammock. So this, uh, I decided that I would do my self portrait asleep, having worked on the war for five or six years at that point, and very kind of, you know, powerful, deep issues, I thought I would just do a self-portrait of sleep, which had many, for me, other kind of interests. One is this, the, the Academy is so well known for realistic painting, and it's hard for an artist to be observing themselves while they're asleep. So I kind of wanted to put a little finger in the whole eye of the realist painting genre, and um, to do a self-portrait while you're asleep is, of course, a, a, impossible. You have to use a camera. I just wanted to make a really large etching that was not directly observed because I had done these direct observations for, of Arrakis for a long time and the, and the content that, the, that they carried was very, very powerful and I wanted to do something more metaphorical. So I worked on this and it's actually uh, eight etching plates. The way the trees are on Cape Cod, which happens to work really nicely I think in the picture, is they only really have live branches way up on the top. If you look just horizontally across the forest, there are no live branches. They all look dead. And then you look up, and there's a kind of canopy of pine needles. So um, many, many people have said, oh, you know, the trees are all dead. And of course, I don't think they're dead, but they're all in some kind of struggle. Anyway, I came back with that portrait, and I showed it to a very close friend of mine who teaches at RISD, Andrew Raftery. He said, what do you call it? I said, a summer artist sleeps. And he said, oh, great, now you can do three more, fall, winter, and spring. You have to do a series. So I came back, and I spent the following year doing um, another large etching, and that one's uh, even larger. I think it's 12 plates. I can't see it from here. And in that one, I was thinking, when I go away for the summer, and I go up to Cape Cod, and it's a very rich environment full of artists from all over the country, really. And the food is incredible. It's New England fish. But, um, but there's no, none of the ethnic food that you have in Philadelphia. And I love having Asian food. So I always have this longing for, um, for either Chinese noodle soups or, or Vietnamese noodles by the time I get back at the end of the summer. And so I thought, well, okay, fall will be a picture of me eating uh, noodles. And I have a friend who I met on Cape Cod um, that summer who um, is a Vietnamese man. He's, he's uh, I would say, probably seven or eight years younger than I am, and he's currently a graduate student at Columbia University. But he told me that the summer that I was working on the portrait of myself in the hammock, he was telling me a story about when he was 13, how he, he grew up in Vietnam. Um, his father had worked for the Americans as a, as a doctor. The family is a very educated and cultured 
family. There was a lot of musicians in the family, different sides of the family. After the war, the father was imprisoned by the North Vietnamese, uh, came back, and the family kept trying to escape Vietnam. His father was away for, for many years, I think, and his mother um, brought him and his siblings. He had a twin. He and his brother were the, the oldest in the family, and then they had several younger siblings, and they would go down and try to find a boat to leave Vietnam. Then they would get arrested, and the whole family would go to jail, but the kids would be let out two or three days later, and the mother would have to stay in jail five or six weeks. So at one point, while his mother was in jail, having tried to escape the family, and the kids were back home with their aunt, the aunt had an opportunity to escape. She just decided that she would take him because if he died on the escape, that the mother would still have her other oldest son and so that the family wouldn't be so terribly hurt because there would still be an oldest son. He was telling me this story and they get on this boat in the middle of the night. They had provisions for 30 people. There were over 90 people on the boat. They had enough gas and food and water for three days. They ended up being 19 days at sea. He described being boarded by Thai pirates three times, and the Thai pirates would come on and uh, beat people, rape the, the women if they wanted to. And then he said, thank God for the Thai pirates. And I thought, well, why? And he said, well, when they left, they would always throw us food and some water. And if it wasn't for the Thai pirates boarding the ship, that they would never have survived at all. After 19 days in the middle of the night, the, the ship runs aground in Thailand, and he washes ashore. And he said the very first thing he saw was an enormously fat English woman. He said it was the first fat person he'd ever seen. It was really strong impression for him. And it took him 11 years to reconnect with his mother and the rest of his family. He was telling me this, and as I was listening to him and thinking, oh, those were the years that I was finishing high school and going to college, and, you know, I went to a very nice college, and uh, my parents had enough money to pay for it. And I just, you know, the difference between his experience and my experience were incredible. And, and I wanted to make a portrait about his experience in some way and kind of combine it with how, how ignorant Americans allow themselves to be about the immigration experience in general. So I wanted to, you know, I have this love of ethnic food. So long as nobody in the restaurant ever talks to me about their life, it's fine. It's nice, easy experience. I can just go and get noodles and complain if the water dish is dirty. And then I can leave and give them like $3 and a, a dollar in tip. But so I kind of, in the second portrait, I pictured myself kind of shoving pho, which is Vietnamese soup, into my mouth. It's centered. And then the waiter is this friend of mine who's in the foreground and his story, um, you know, I interviewed him and, and collected his words. So his story is kind of, I think there's a Renaissance tradition like Durer did it where you tell the story on the bottom of a painting and, um, and all kind of with this big marquee P-H-O, which means the kind of noodle soup. But if you translate it in phonetically into F-A-U-X, the whole thing reads as false. And so there's something kind of false um, so it seems to me that um, that you're always feeling empathy for all of these people who have all of these problems. When uh, when we came in today, you were talking about a new project about military rape victims, and and this guy, this Vietnamese friend of yours. So I'm I'm just wondering where does that outrage come from? This constant <laughs> fuel that keeps you going. Who know? I don't know. I, you know, empathy, um, empathy and anger are very, very different. So I actually don't feel that guilty vis-a-vis -vis this friend. I feel guilty vis-a-vis -vis my culture, what kind of short shrift we give them. But um, and there's a lot of outrage there. But I, I don't know. My, my family's been um, my mother ran a school for kids that were kicked out of school because they had essentially what's now is diagnosed as either attention deficit disorder or dyslexia or some kind of learning learning disability. And um, my my oldest brother um, has always been very involved in social issues. He's a union organizer now for the, I don't know what their um, their current title is. I think it's Unite Here. But they, they're a hotel and restaurant workers union. And they, they he was down here for a couple of years, over the last couple of years, fighting for a new contract for the cafeteria workers. And so that's the kind of stuff that he does. Then my second brother, after college, he went to Senegal and worked in the Peace Corps for a while, and then he worked in South America as a, as a small microloan micro micro yeah. service. Anyway, my, all of my brothers were kind of examples as I was growing up of, of kind of um, how you can engage in the world. 
I mean, I had a very privileged education. I went to public school, then I went to an Ivy League undergraduate school and an Ivy League graduate school. And I'm just floored how how people take things for granted and how they don't they don't understand that that's an incredible privilege. So you teach at a Ivy League school. You teach yeah. at Princeton, among other places. So do you imbue your students with this sort of idea that they have privilege and the world is a bigger place? It's an interesting question. No. I don't, I don't, as an art teacher, and I teach introduction, an introductory course at Princeton, I don't want to be the art teacher that made all the students work like them. I want them to come to art making open to what, wherever it brings them. And I show them my work, but I show them my work as well as a lot of other people's work. I'm always incredibly hesitant to, to, to like assign them, you know, now I want you to do something empathetic or, you know. So do you print your own works? Well, I, when I do um, woodblocks, I print all my own woodblocks, which there's one over there. And I love printing woodblocks. And I've printed etchings. I know how to print etchings. I'm just, I don't have a press and I'm not very efficient at it. So um, for many years, maybe 20 years, I've been working with Cindy Ettinger at CR Ettinger Studio. And um, she prints all the etchings and she's incredible at it. So what's coming up next for you? Are you working on your winter self-portrait now? I'm working on spring, uh, winter, and spring is kind of gelling in my head. And um, let me, can we just set, stop there for one second? I want to show you. Oh my gosh. And then oh, that this one. is all together? Yeah, it's a big, it's just this, I mean, the new one. No, we have to describe it. There are four, uh, blocks of plaster on which there's an image that continues over from the left to right on all four of them. And on the left, there's the face of a man with something in his mouth that's connected by a thread to his hand, which is over on, or somebody's hand, on the right. And it's, it's, print, it's, it's black kind of cross-hatching etching lines. And the, the plaster, this one is um, dental plaster, because I met an artist in Japan who prints on plaster, and he says, oh, you have to use dental plaster. So this was a kind of first experiment with dental plaster, and actually I don't like it as much. Yeah. But it's very, very hard. It's very modern in a kind of 50s way. It's very bright white, and the ink, um, when it prints correctly, and you can see on these two, it didn't print correctly, but here, when it prints correctly, it's really clean black lines, and it's also got a physicality that a print on a paper doesn't have. And so for my winter project, what I want to do is a long scene of a forest. Can we interrupt? I want to show you one more thing. Sure. The other so, element. Woo! <laughs> the other element for the... Um, so what, the winter portrait is going to be a long wall of a forest where this mythical scene takes place from Botticelli. And... Um, Instead of the mythical scene from Botticelli, what I'm thinking of having is from Primavera and Botticelli, there's a, um, an image of three graces. So instead of three graces, I'm going to have three men kind of entangled. I've got part of it started upstairs in the middle of this woods, the sylvan kind of atmosphere. And that's all going to be printed on, on wood veneer. And then a part of it is going to be these trees printed on plaster that kind of stick out of the wood with a very large night owl who's taking off from a tree branch and the whole thing will have a kind of image of snow. And then in front of it, kind of like a casket, there'll be um, a rectangular box made out of plaster, which pictures me on the surface of it asleep, dressed up in winter clothing. And I don't really know what it means right now. There are a bunch of images and I don't really know how it's gonna work out, but that's what I'm working on. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. And on that note, we have to say thank you, Daniel. It's been a whirlwind of wonderful Sorry. talk. Oh, and we wish we could stay longer. But... You are such a storyteller. It's just wonderful. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. Well, for thanks for coming. Us. Thanks for coming. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.